share your presentation there. I'm super excited about this. I've uh, been an archery hunter on and off for probably 20-ish years. And my daughters, I, I live not too far from in the Hudson area where A1 Archery is, and my daughters take some archery lessons from Dana. And she's also a mentor for our Become an Outdoor Woman program. And I think you're actually doing one this weekend. Was it past weekend or? This weekend. We leave this Friday. Weekend coming up. Yep. Awesome. So uh, just a, a great person, a very knowledgeable coach, and a knowledgeable bow hunter also. So I'm excited to listen to your presentation. And I think with that, Dana, we'll turn it over to you. Awesome. And let you go. Thank you. Thank you, Benji. Um, this is really cool to be able to do this. I've never done a webinar before, and um, I'm excited to be able to give you guys some ideas on how to prepare for your successful archery season. Um, I am a bow hunter. I am an archery coach. I have been shooting for 33 years this year. Um, I've been hunting the majority of that time, and over the years, I've learned a lot of things. I know, you know, as an instructor and a teacher and a coach, we don't all know everything. So um, these are just tips and tricks that I've learned that help me prepare for a successful archery season. So I hope you guys um, enjoy, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask at the end, all right? So these are the topics that we're gonna cover today. Um, we're gonna cover location, wind, scent, shooting lanes and stands, quietness, bow tuning, practicing with broadheads, and some whitetail anatomy, just to help you guys. So um, that first one we're gonna cover is location. Um, if we look at that diagram, that picture that's on the upper right hand side, it actually shows you a really good example of what it means to be downwind from your deer. Um, it's a great thing because you can see that hunter, you can see those critters out feeding in what could be a food plot um, or an area where there's some grasses that they really enjoy. Um, when you're looking for a location, you want to consider wind, but also that location is key. You want to scout out your land util utilizing an overview of your property first. Use a phone app if possible. So when you're looking at your phone app, um, there are a lot of good phone apps out there, Onyx, um, Hunt Stand. There's a lot of different phone apps. Even um, some of the DNR places have really good phone apps that show you um, ridges, water, meadows, food sources. They show you all those really cool things. And sometimes even they'll even show you if there's um, oak trees, if there's acorns. Um, they'll show you lots of really awesome stuff like that. So those are the things that you're going to want to look for because those are the things that the deer really like. So if you're looking for um, a good stand, you're gonna wanna look for some ridge lines. If you're looking for a, blind, um, a ground blind, you might wanna be near a meadow where there's um, some food there. You wanna be sure that there's water in that area so that there's something that those deer are going to. And then actually get your feet on the ground. Um, hop out, get out in the woods, check out that area, see what you see um, for deer sign, because you want to know where are your deer going um, and where are they? So look for that sign. So look for tracks, look for trails, look for feeding and bedding areas and rubs and scrapes. Now, if you're not familiar, if you're brand new to hunting and you're not familiar what a rub is, um, it's actually a tree that has been um, rubbed by the, the buck's antlers. Um, that's what a rub is. If you're looking for a scrape, those are usually it's a it's a big round area where the deer actually have been scraping with their feet then they urinate over their tarsal glands and usually if there's a scrape there it's kind of a way to mark their territory um, usually if there's a scrape right there there's a licking branch over the top so there's a branch where they actually lick and they rub their eyes and they rub their horns and they rub their face on that branch. So those are really good things to look for as you're getting those feet on the ground and checking out that hunting area. You know, figure out where those spots are, where that good area where you can totally get a shot of deer is. And then another question you might wanna ask is, what time do your deer come through this area? A lot of people will use cameras. Um, they'll put out game tracking cameras just to see are the deer coming here in the mornings or are they coming there in the evenings. If you utilize that, um, that point, 
what happens is you can actually say, well, geez, I, I have so much availability in the evening, but if these deer are only coming through here in the mornings, it's kind of ridiculous for me to sit here in an evening sit. So it might sway you and shift you to another spot where there's more opportunity for you to shoot. And then a big thing you wanna look at is which direction does the wind prevail? And can you get into this spot undetected? So again, if we look at that downwind picture, you wanna be able to get into that area without having those deer smell you. Um, Cause if they smell you, they're gonna be gone. All right, so talking about wind, there's a really good saying, if the wind is in your face, you're in the right place. Wind from behind, the animals will smell you every time. And that is so true. Um, they will smell you if the wind is blowing at them. No different than if you were in the mountains. Um, I've hunted elk before where you have to think about the thermals, how they move up and down those canyons. But you always want to know which way the wind is going when heading into your stand. Um, the phone apps, again, show you lots of times um, the wind direction. Or even if you don't have the phone app, lots of times on your phone in general, the um, weather app will tell you which way that wind is going. That's also another key to help you um, be able to get a good, a good wind to get into that spot. Um, your entrance and exit ways to your stand are blind are so important when you're thinking about wind. Um, and then when placing your stand or blind, know which way the predominant wind goes in that area. You want to pay attention, you know, is this is this a good stand for a north wind? Is this a good stand for a south wind? Um, am I hunting down in a bowl? If you're hunting in a bowl, that wind's going to be swirling around in there. So you want to be sure that you're paying attention to that predominant wind as well. And then consider having multiple stands on one property to allow for different winds. So like I said, you might have this stand is good for north winds. This stand is good for south winds. Um, I can actually get into this one better um, during a south wind. You, you can figure out how can I work this where it works better for me. And so the animals don't know that I'm there. So always consider that wind. And I will tell you, honestly, when I first started hunting, I didn't know anything about wind. I didn't know anything about wind. Um, I have learned so much over the years about wind. And when you get with hunters that really, really pay attention to the wind, you'll see how important it is. Um, always, always, always pay attention to that wind. Um, when you're talking about shooting lanes and stands, um, this is a great picture. I mean, if you look at this picture, the guy is very camouflaged up there. Um, it's a great big tree. Deer are gonna have a hard time seeing him because he looks like he's part of the tree. So you wanna consider silhouetting. Which direction does the sun set? Will it be behind you or will it be in your eyes? That's one thing to think of. Like if you're standing there and the sun's beating you in the face and it's hard for you to see because it's beating you in the face, are you gonna actually be able to get that shot? or is it gonna be behind you? And is your whole body gonna be silhouetted? Um, is there a tree nearby for cover? So are you hunting in like this big oak tree that he's in? And that's an oak tree. Are you hunting in that tree that's actually like the same size as you or are you hunting in a tiny tree? You wanna be in a bigger tree and look up from the deer's perspective. So, get down in that meadow or wherever you are outside of that stand and look up and actually like imagine if I was a deer, would I see myself up there? Um, think about that part too, because sometimes you will be like, wow, I would stick out like a sore thumb if I was there. That's not a good spot for me to be. Um, wider trunk trees might hide you. So just like this one, like I said, it's nice and big. That fella doesn't look like he's a tiny guy. Um, that's a nice, nice, big, sturdy tree, but he looks like he's part of it, which is really, really awesome. And big, healthy trees are always the best. They're obviously harder to use with climbers because they're so wide, but they're great for ladders or lock-ons. Um, I, I love a good ladder stand. Um, you can feel very safe in a ladder stand. Um, double ladder stand is like you're in the Taj Mahal because you have room for all of your stuff. Big trees are awesome. 
when you're hunting, be sure that once you get up into that spot and you're looking down at your area that you're going to be using as your shooting lanes, do not over prune. Do not over prune. You want to leave things that don't hinder your shots. So you want to be able to have an area where you can draw back that bow and have that deer maybe not see you and then have them walk into that opening where you have. Because if you prune everything away, then sure enough, you might draw back and they might see you move. So if possible, try to leave other things in the way so that it gives you those opportunities to draw back or even say the shot doesn't present itself and you have to let down. If you have a little bit more stuff in the way, you can wait for them to get to that spot before you let down. Um, don't over prune, okay? If possible, set up your stands or blinds long before your hunting season so that animals get used to them. Um, I know it's not easy if you're hunting on public land because you don't want to leave your stuff out there. It's really hard to do that. But if you're hunting on private property, go ahead and set that stuff up way early. Let those critters get used to it. Um, it's actually a really good way too, if you have your blind out there and say you don't have it staked down just right and then a windy day comes along right prior to there and you notice, hey, oh my gosh, this, this is moving on me. Go ahead and make sure you have that button down, tied down, strapped down good enough that it's gonna be a great spot for you to hunt that year. So the longer you can leave them up, the better. Be safe and use a five point safety harness and a safety line on your tree stand. Now we sell those safety lines and I've hunted um, at different places that have had the safety lines. They are amazing and they will save you if you're going to fall. So use that safety harness, use that safety line. They're super easy. All you do is you hook your strap onto there you slide it up as you go up that tree and if you do slip or if you do fall it'll catch you and that's what we want we want to save people from getting injured so if you can wear that safety harness and your um your safety belt and use that lifeline it's wonderful now i've seen some people that they want to get a really big safety harness because they want it to be able to go over but if you think of it like over your clothes, if you think about it, sometimes you can even layer that under some of your bigger layers. You just have to be able to pull it out. So some hunting clothes actually have the hole for your safety harness strap to come out the back. Other hunting clothes, they might not have that. So you might have to kind of pull it out. Your, If it has a hood, you might have to pull it out from that hood area there but it, it'll keep you safe. And that's the whole idea is we wanna keep you safe when you're up in the tree stand. We want you, if you get to harvest an animal, to harvest that animal and bring it home. So be safe. Check your stand, your seat, your pull up ropes, et cetera, for damage from animals during the off season. Now I've <laughs> had to deal with some squirrels that have chewed things. Um, or like mice, one time I got up in my tree stand and I went to pull my seat open and there was a mouse house in there. There's there's a whole bunch of critters that could be in there. So you always wanna make sure that you're just checking your stand, checking your ropes. And especially if you have a stand that's on private property and you're leaving it there for a long time, be sure that you check the tension on that. Be sure that you know nothing's getting frayed or that you know something isn't getting like a dry rot and coming apart, or maybe that the tree's not just growing around it because as the trees grow, if you have straps or ropes on there, sometimes um, you know that tree will grow right around it. We wanna make sure that everything's safe. So be sure you check your stand and your ropes and make sure there's no damage. I have actually um, known people that were trying to pull their bow up into the stand and didn't realize that the rope um, was partially chewed. So I always keep my rope that I pull my bow up in, in my backpack, in my hunting pack on me, so that when I climb up into that tree stand, I've got it hooked right to me and I know that rope is good. Uh, I don't really wanna drop my expensive bow out of a tree. I, we've seen it happen here at the shop numerous times. And if you can save yourself from that and be able to actually have a nice sit that night, that's what we want. So um, that's what, that's what we're gonna try and do. Now, we're gonna talk about scent. <laughs> I 
I was kind of funny and I put some cookies up there. Um, lots of people like chocolate chip cookies. But the funny thing about scent is say that you walk into someone's house and say that they have a litter box, they have a cat. If they're cooking cookies, if they're baking cookies, or if they're um, cooking something amazing, let's say a pot roast or something like that, your senses are going to be filled with that awesome smell. So if it smells like cookies, you're not going to smell that kitty litter box. You're going to be smelling the cookies. So when we think about scent, think about it that way. Think about, you know, are, you, are deer going to be smelling you or are they not? So hunting totes, oh my gosh, I have so many hunting totes. They are great for your clothes and boots to be put on at the truck. At the truck. <laughs> um, I only wear my base layers in my vehicle with a pair of tennis shoes going to my hunting spot. Then I get out of my truck and I pull out my tote and I have my boots, I have my hunting clothes, I have my backpack, it's all in totes. I pull all my clothes out, put all my, my other layers on, put my boots on, and then I leave. Um, my boots do never ever touch the gas pedals on my truck. Gas pedals, when you if you were to touch your hunting boots on the gas pedals, your boots are gonna smell like gas. They're going to smell like the grocery store. They're going to smell like anything else that your feet have touched with your tennis shoes or whatever shoes that you had on before that. So I'm a real big stickler about my hunting boots um, and my clothes. I don't wear my clothes anywhere but in the woods. I keep them in the tote. They're kept washed. Um, and it, it's a totally separate thing. I don't want to smell like anything. So use your unscented soaps, shampoos, deodorants and body washes. Um, when you think about using unscented soaps and shampoos, there, there are body wash type soaps. You can get the combination that includes the shampoo and conditioner. You can get some hunting um, shampoos that come separate from the separate conditioner. Um, you always want to remember that everything should smell like nothing, unless there is one product that um, people really like, and that's called Nose Jammers. Nose Jammers actually smells like vanilla. And for a lot of us girls, we don't want to smell like dirt or nothing. And so vanilla actually is kind of like cookies. So when the deer smell that vanilla, it fills their olfactory and they are like, wow, all I smell is that. I do know some of the guys that have actually used the field spray on the bottoms of their boots and walked out. To their hunting stand and they see the deer follow their footprints all the way to the stand literally to the rungs of the stand so they're curious they they like that smell they don't know what that smell is um but again that's a product that just uses vanilla otherwise everything should be scent free no scents and when you talk about those shampoos and body washes and stuff when you get out of the shower what does your towel smell like if you use a towel that has been washed in Tide, your towel is going to smell like Tide. So now you took the time to have your totally unscented body and your rubbing Tide towel on there. So when I'm hunting and I'm when I'm like really getting out there or bear hunting or whatever I might be doing, all including my towels and everything are all washed scent free. All washed scent free. I don't have I don't use the same stuff the rest of my family does. Um, do not use colognes or perfumes. We, I work at an archery shop here and we at A1 Archery, when it gets to be hunting season, nobody smells like anything. Nobody. Are you? They walk through the doors, they don't smell like anything. But if someone that's not a hunter comes in and they smell like cologne or perfume, woo, we're all like, whoa, is that a wall? Because um, it is, it's such a strong smell. We don't realize how strong it is, but you definitely don't. When you are, it's hunting season, you're serious about hunting, you don't want to be using colognes or perfumes. Stay away from those. And then as women go, like, does your makeup have a smell to it? I've known like a lot of times where I bought a moisturizer or something. And if you open that up, if you've never used it before and it smells like perfume, you're, are you going to rub perfume on your face? I hope not. Um, so smell your makeup if you're a lady. Um, 
you know, think about what am I putting on my face? What am I putting on my body? And then what does your house smell like? It's a funny question, but does your, if your house constantly smells like Febreze or candles, and if you walk through your house with your hunting clothes on, are you going to smell scent free or are you going to smell like Febreze or candles? Okay. I always think Febreze just because that's a really strong smell to me. And then with your hunting clothes, like I said, wash all your clothes in scent free detergent and dry them outside. Um, that fresh air, it just makes them even more so scent free. It makes them smell like outside. And then once they're dried, then you can pack them up and put them away. And actually, I'm a stickler. I always wash and dry my clothes out on the line, and then I spray them with tick spray while they're still um, out there dry. And then I let them dry even longer with the tick spray. Then I bring them in. I, I don't like ticks, and I like to keep myself safe from ticks. So with your hunting clothes, if you spray them off right then, then you're not worried about having to do it again later. And you don't want to spray tick spray on your person. Like if your clothes are on, you don't spray tick spray. That's not good for you. So um, wicking base layers with your hunting clothes keep bacteria from creating odor. And merino wool is my absolute favorite. I learned about this um, quite a few years ago when I was going on an elk hunt. Um, merino wool, it is wool, so it will shrink um, as you wash it. You just got to wash it in cold and... Um, but it is so, it's antibacterial and it's a warm base layer, but you can wear it even when it's warm out and it wicks away the sweat. So um, merino wool is my absolute favorite when it comes to my hunting base layers for clothes. And then wear less clothing to the stand so you don't sweat. So you don't want to put eight tons of clothes on and then make your way to your stand and be all sweaty and icky by the time you get there. So what I do is I actually throw my extra hunting clothes, my over layers into my backpack and I'll walk out to the stand um, in the lighter layers. And then when I get up in there and I get all situated and get my bow hung up, then I throw on my, my bigger clothes, my the overclothes. So like my coat or my um, hoodie or whatever it is, I put that on once I'm up in there and have more clothing layers in your pack. So one really good tip that I learned, um, down is wonderful. It is super warm. It gives you that puffy layer where it helps you keep that warmth in you without swishing it on you. If you have like layer upon layer upon layer and it's all tight, it's not gonna have room to breathe to keep that air. So I always keep um, just, and you can wad it up really tiny. I keep a wadded up, um, tiny vest, a wool vest in my bottom of my hunting pack. And that is a great way. If you get chilly up there, you can actually pull that out, put that on, throw your your over layers over the top again, and you'll be way warmer. Um, another thing about having more clothing layers in your pack is if you get chilly, if you have hunting rain gear in your bag, if you get chilly out there, throw on the pants, throw on those hunting pants. Um, if they're camouflage, throw them on right over the top of the clothes you're wearing. It'll cut the wind. It'll keep you warming. It'll keep you or warm. It'll keep you in the stand longer. It'll keep you hunting is what it'll do. So even if you're in the blind and you get chilly, throw that raincoat on. Um, and when it comes to hunting raincoats and rain gear, they do try to make them really quiet, especially the new ones, um, because they know that people are walking and they um, don't want noise. So I love my hunting rain gear. I use it all the time. It's in there pretty much no matter what the weather is. It's in there just to keep me warm. And then as far as snacks go, what are you taking for snacks in the stand? Um, if you're turkey hunting, yeah, you can take some jerky and some cheese and sausage trays out there. Whatever you want to take out there is fine because turkeys don't have a good sense of smell. But if you're going deer hunting, you really don't want to be taking like summer sausage or something that's very smelly or that you're going to get on your hands and then you're going to be touching your bow and you're going to be touching the stand and, and the deer are going to smell that. So apples, nuts, protein bars usually don't smell um, very strong. They're great snacks to take in there. Um, I love taking, if you take an apple, you can chuck it down on the ground. You can watch squirrel eat it. 
um, sometimes it's pretty cool just to be able to watch squirrels if you're in the stand um, or another animal could come along a raccoon or whatever it is and enjoy a little snack too so apples are a great snack to take into the hunting blind and one more key like i said um, what does your truck smell like does your truck smell like febreze or air fresheners um, your hunting boots on the pedals will smell like gasoline okay so when you get in your truck if it if it smells strong of cologne air fresheners um, whatever you have in there think about that if i'm driving in that truck to my spot i want to be sure that i can still stay as fr scent free as possible so quietness when we are walking in and out of the stands, we want to try walking from your heel to your toe and avoid stepping on sticks and branches. Pick up your feet and pay attention to where you step. Soften your knees and keep your legs bent. Now, one of the biggest, I would say biggest compliments that I got was it was actually the first year that I was elk hunting out in Idaho and I was hunting with a fellow that lived there and he hunted all the time and he, um, very very knowledgeable and we were hunting along this canyon and he stopped for a second he turned around looked at me and he said dana i love hunting with you <laughs> and i was like cool i like hunting with you too and he goes no 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 he goes i don't even hear you when you're behind me and i said well that's the point like if you're in front of me if you hear something you shouldn't be hearing me but if you hear something you're gonna stop and then I need to stop because I need to see or hear what you heard. So my goal every time I go in and out of the stand is I want to be as silent as I can. I want to be super quiet. I want to be like, like quiet as a mouse. Um, so I'm always trying, whoops, I'm always trying to just be as quiet as possible. And then can you get into your stand quietly? When raising or lowering your bow, how can you keep that more quiet? Do you need to put some moleskin on your clips? Maybe you need to put some moleskin on your tree stand bars. Like say your bow hangs at a funny position where maybe the cam wants to hit that, that bar of the tree stand all the time. Maybe you need to just throw some moleskin on there or put an extra pad on there or something. Think about getting into that stand quietly quietly and trying not to make a bunch of noise. Um, if there's a bunch of brush in the way, like say the tree has lots of um, branches and stuff that when you pull your bow up, it's, it's just pulling through all of that. You might wanna trim some of that stuff away so you can get it up there nice and quietly. And then the dreaded cough. No one wants the whole world to know you are there because of a cough. So try to muffle your cough as much as possible if it's unavoidable. I have been on hunts where I don't know if it was allergies or what, um, but I could not stop coughing. And so frustrating. You can't have a cough drop because it smells like cough drop. And you're just trying to take little sips of water and keep it muffled. Um, if you have like a neck gaiter where you can try to keep that in here, that's a good way to try to muffle that cough. But you just have to do the best that you can or just maybe not go hunting that day. But that dreaded cough, man, it's a crazy thing. So now we're gonna talk about bow tuning. And this one's a big one for me because I work at an archery shop. Oh, I'm flipping around in there. I work at an archery shop and bow tuning is Super important. You need to make sure and verify that your bow is timed and tuned often, especially if you start noticing differences in your shooting or you are going on a hunting trip. Your strings and cables on your bow should be changed every two years. Three years is going a long time. Okay, you have to remember the bow is no different than a guitar. Guitars go out of tune, just sitting in their case, just like bows do. Um, so just because your bow has been sitting in a case and you haven't been shooting it, doesn't mean that it's still timed and tuned. You need to have that checked. Because an arrow that doesn't have good flight will definitely change where it hits the target. So really, bring it into a bow shop, 
have that bow timed and tuned, especially before you go on a hunt, just make sure you get her checked out because if it did change, they can actually tune that bow and get it back into spec where it needs to be. And, you know, I've seen people that wait a long, long time to change their bow strings and cables. You want to do both of them at the same time. Don't just change the strings and not the cables because it's like changing your oil in your truck without changing the oil filter. Got to change those strings and cables. Um, I saw one time where a guy, he he was like, no, no, the, it, I don't need any, I don't need it tuned. I don't need anything. And the thing was so out of whack. The arrow was terrible. And I was like, you have to take this bow up front. You have to have them work on this bow because the arrow flight was horrible. Um, so always remember to do that bow tuning. Go to a reputable shop and have that bow looked at. And especially before a deer hunt or a turkey hunt or any kind of hunt, you know, make sure that you've got it checked out. All right, so now we're going to broadheads. So with our broadheads, um, all broadheads need to be sighted in before going out hunting, before going out hunting. They will fly differently from your field points. Okay, now I'm gonna explain. Fixed blades fly differently from mechanical. Mechanical heads should only be used by how higher poundage shooters, okay? This is what I'm saying. I shoot 50 pounds out of my bow. In my opinion, I would not shoot a mechanical broadhead. My opinion, that's just, I don't feel like I want to risk getting an ethical shot on a critter if my blade doesn't open up, okay? So I, since I shoot 50 pounds, I love a fixed blade broadhead. Now, if you go different places in different states, they have different requirements and different rules too. So you could go to Idaho elk hunting. Idaho only, they require you shoot a fixed blade broadhead. You cannot shoot a mechanical broadhead. Okay, so you have to have that sighted in. Now, one time I did actually go on a turkey hunt and I was super excited. I had this woman that I was working with and we got out there in the blind and I had the decoy set and, and she's getting her stuff ready. And she goes, and here's my broadheads. And they were still in the package. They're still in the package. And I was like, oh no, tell me you shot at least one of these. Tell me you shot at least one of these so that we know how this is gonna fly. And she's like, oh no, I was just gonna put them on right now. So. I hate to say it, but I prayed to God that a turkey did not come out in front of us because we don't know. I mean, for me personally, my broadheads usually drop four to six inches from where my field points hit. Four to six inches, that is huge. Especially, I mean, it's huge on a turkey, but it's huge on a deer too. So make sure that you get those broadheads sighted in before you head out hunting. Make sure they're flying. Even a mechanical head, they have, they have practice heads in there um, or just designate. Use one broadhead for your practice head. This head should never be used for hunting, only practice. Again, personal opinion, if I shoot at a critter and if I use that broadhead, to me it is not ethical to reuse that broadhead. I won't. Um, they do make some broadheads that can be resharpened. I don't spend the time resharpening. I want that to be surgically sharp. I buy new ones. Um, but the nice part is, is if you use, so usually broadheads come in like a three pack. So what I do is I actually, I take that one out that's gonna be designated as my practice head. I sight in just with that one arrow, boom, check, pull it out, boom, check pull it out. And then I actually on the outside of the package, or you can actually use a, a fishing, like a fishing lure box, like the plastic ones, they're super awesome for broadheads. You can draw with a black Sharpie on the top of that, or on the top of that packaging, put a P on there. That means it's your practice head. That is your designated head. Then you're not using all the other broadheads. Um, you, you don't have to use two, three, six of them. Use one. Use one, designate that one as your practice head and use that one for practice, but not for hunting, okay? Um, always try to get that beautiful shot and I would always wanna just trust that I have the sharpest head on there as possible. So that's what, that's what I would do.
Oh, I moved too far. Alrighty, so whitetail anatomy. This is our last little piece here that we're going to talk about. And, it, and we're going to talk about this just because it, it's really cool. When you're thinking about deer, you need to know that whitetail anatomy. You need to know where those vitals are. So archers should practice shooting at the vitals, which are the heart and the lungs, for a quicker kill. Know where these are located, all right? That is going to give you the, the best, cleanest shot is if you aim for the vitals. So know how to judge your yardage and put markers out if you if needed to help you, because then you'll have not only your distance, but now you know where the vitals are and you can aim right at those. And if you look at these awesome diagrams, you can see you can see what a broadside shot looks like because that's where the vital is on the broadside. It's behind that elbow and it's up kind of not quite midsection of the body, but it's behind that elbow back a little bit and, and almost, almost in that bottom part of that body right there. If you look at the quartering away shot, you can take a broadside or a quartering away shot. And this is really nice too, because you can slip it right in there past that rib cage for a good shot that gives that nice angle. But you don't wanna take a facing shot on a deer. On an elk, that's fine, because an elk has a big area in the front that you can actually kill them. On a deer, they don't have that. And if you hit a little bit too far, like from the midsection, if you hit a little too far to the right or to the left, if that slips right past that shoulder, if you've ever processed a deer, you know it. the shoulders are the weirdest things in the world because when you when you quarter that animal, when you take that off, there's nothing that holds that on. There's no ball joint in the shoulder. It just, it comes off whoop, one big piece. So if you are aiming at that deer and it's facing at you, chances of you getting it are not good at all because if it slips past there, well, it might create a wound, but it might not get anything. So always go and strive to go um, have those beautiful broadside or quartering away shots. Take your time, wait for it to happen. Because if you look down here, and I really love these um, anatomy pictures that we have here. If you look down here, you'll actually see. So here's the here's the shoulder blade. Okay, here's the elbow and the heart and the lungs are right here. Okay, so again, right here, here's the lungs, here's the heart. Okay, if you get back here, which is really good to know, if you get back here into the guts, which is like the intestines in that, you need to let that animal lay for six to eight hours to die. Okay. Um, and if you look down here, I have, if you shoot an animal in the guts, wait at least six to eight hours before tracking it. If you track a gut shot deer right away, you will make the animal run farther with less of a blood trail to follow. Um, you have to let it die. Um, if you push it, the adrenaline will kick in and you will have no blood to follow. I've actually seen where um, a gut shot deer, the guts actually plugged up the hole, no trail to follow. No trail, because the guts plugged it up. So there was no blood, there was no nothing. It just, the guts plugged the hole. You have to wait, let them die. If you know you hit them in the guts, let them die. Usually they'll give a little kick if you hit them back too far, let them die on their own. Um, and then I always have my archers aim a little lower versus mid body to help with leaving that good blood trail. Mid body height shots or higher will have internal bleeding but less blood trail to follow. So if you think about it, if you hit it high, the deer will still die, but it's gonna just bleed internally, okay? If you hit midsection or low, the blood's gonna come out. It has like an escape to come out to give you that trail to follow. So try to, to aim for the midsection or a little bit low and go for that heart and lung, okay? And then our last one here, um, I hope that you guys enjoy this. I hope you maybe learned some stuff. I hope everyone um, has good luck out there this year. If you guys have any questions, I know Benji's on here, but I also put a little blurb about what we offer here at A1 Archery. We have beginner classes, intermediate classes, homeschool leagues, women's leagues, which are super popular. Um, we have winter indoor spot leagues and 3D leagues. And then I do give small 
um, group and private lessons here at the shop as well. But yeah, that's my talk for today. <laughs> awesome job. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Learn a little bit more every time I listen to you. So nice. <laughs> we, had, we had a few questions come in that I is, is always fun. You get a lot of I get a lot of thank yous. Learned a tons. Thanks, Dana. Oh, good. Thank you, uh, Nathan and just Kay, the other one. So, um, they had one in the in the chat again. If you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q and A. It helps us get to it a little easier. But uh, Amber sent me one from the chat when you were talking about, you know, scent is a big diff, a big deal, especially in archery hunting compared to, you know, rifle season or something up north. And you talked about putting everything in like a tote, a plastic bin. Yes. Uh, what about the plastic smell in there? Do you treat your stuff or worry about that at all? So when I have my hunting stuff in my plastic bins, lots of times I will, I have like an oz ozone, uh, it's like an ozone machine that actually takes the smell out of there. So yeah, Rubbermaid bins do have a lot of smell and totes have a lot of smell to them, but I'll run that machine in there for them a little bit um, just to kind of get that smell out of there. And then I'll put my hunting clothes in. So over the years, yes, there's there's been more and more bins in my life. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a that's a really good question. But that is what I do is I, I like to do that. They also make like, um, they make duffel bags and things that you can use just for your hunting stuff that actually already has like the ozone in there or something. Um, I've, I've not used one of those before because my totes are pretty good and, and a duffel bag seems kind of squishy to me, but yeah, that's a good question. I used to have a charcoal thing, like a charcoal pad or something it was that I'd throw in a, all my stuff in a plastic bag with that charcoal pad to kind of keep the odor down. Yeah. So, so yeah. there's something about, when you drive through farm country and you see all the orange suits hanging up before deer season, there's, there's something to that. They're trying to get the there scent is. out. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. If you drive past my house, it's, I have one of those clotheslines that, yeah, it's all coated with my hunting stuff. <laughs> Dana did a load. <laughs> uh, Mark was asking, are afternoon sits a bad idea this early in the season? I would say no. Um, for me, for me personally, any chance that I get to be out there, if I know the deer are going to be there, I'm going to be there. The only thing that might keep me out of the woods is the 90 some degree days. Yesterday. It's 90, yes. Yesterday was so humid and it was so hot. And if it's 90 some degrees now, granted, you can be a really, really good shot. Um, but since this is hunting, if something were to happen and you take that good shot and bait and like by chance say you have to leave it overnight i don't i don't want to risk the the meat going to waste so afternoon hunt and you know because i work i i would do afternoon hunt just because i'm available to do them then but i i worry more about the weather the the heat yeah early early archery season gets to be and i, I know a lot of guys will keep a lot of ice around and they'll fill that cavity up in the deer with ice to, to yeah. try to keep it and age it a little bit too. So yeah. Uh, Christopher has a couple of questions in here. First ever season deer hunting and he's borrowing a crossbow. Okay. So we didn't talk about crossbows a whole lot, but he has a couple of questions. What point should I draw the bow and how long can I leave it drawn? Okay. So with a crossbow, you want to have, that drawn um when you get up in that stand then draw that back um or i don't know if he's hunting out of a blind or hunting out of a tree stand of course then you have to be careful because i don't know if i'd want to be taking that thing up there if it's cocked back necessarily no. but if you're in a blind if you're in a blind i would cock that back now it depends some make noise when you cock them back some don't but I would wait until you're actually like in that position where where you're in your stand or in your blind and then cock that bow, get it ready. And then you want to discharge that bow when you're done hunting. So if it has where you can let it back down and decock it, that's awesome. Or if it's one of those that has to be shot, be sure that you have a target that you can just shoot that into um, when you get back to the truck. 
but you don't want to leave them cocked for a long period of time. We had, I think this was last year, we had a guy come into the shop that said, I don't know what's wrong with my crossbow. It's just flying terrible. Like the arrow just goes bloop, 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 bloop. Well, here he left it cocked all year. All year since last hunting season. Um, not a good idea because then the limbs got used to being in that position. So literally you want to be able to decock that bow or you want to be able to shoot that arrow into something when you get back in your vehicle. Plus, I think it's it's against the law to drive with that cocked. If I'm it could correct. be. I believe it is. I believe it's like illegal to drive with a, cross, a crossbow cocked in your vehicle. That that would not because it would probably be considered a loaded firearm. And and there are let's be clear, I'm not positive on these rules. And we live in different states between Minnesota and Wisconsin. So yeah. yeah. You, know, you might not have to have a case, a bow in a case, but a crossbow is a little bit different. So if it is cocked, I would consider that myself, I'd consider that potentially to be a loaded weapon, which yes. would be against the law. So yes. We might Even have a CO have officer an out there. Yeah. yeah. I'd be afraid, more afraid that if it was in the back of my truck or something, if it was cocked, that maybe something else would trigger it, you know, and then it would dry fire. So, yeah, you don't want to destroy it. So, yeah, one of his other, no. one of his other questions was, should I get strings replaced and crossbow tuned just like every other bow? Yes. Yep. So, yep. And Christopher, I would. Highly recommend either going and visiting Dana at A1 Archery or a local archery shop. I'm not for sure where you're located, but and fire that bow a few times and see how it flies and let them, you know, just just give it a once over. It's yep. never a never a bad thing. And if there is something, you know, if you get a wobbly arrow out of there, that they're the ones that can uh, tune that and fix it. So. Yeah. Well, and crossbows, you know, they're not a gun. A lot of people want to treat them kind of like a gun. They're not a gun. Um, so you're not supposed to shoot them over and over. You're supposed to sight them in and then you're supposed to hunt with them. Um, so people forget how they work. It's super common. People, they just forget how, how to work it. So if you're not sure on how to work that crossbow, um, our guys here, are, our technicians are amazing. Um, but make sure you get some help just to figure out how that works ahead of time too, just so you don't get in the stand and I forgot how to do this, you know? Great. A um, few more thank yous in there. Our own Linda Bylander, our bow coordinator, said great job. <laughs> I uh, love her. Carl, Carl is asking, what is an estimated cost for having a bow restrung and tuned? So it depends. It really depends. It depends um, what your bow needs. It depends on how much out of whack it is because uh, I want to say, I think the Matthew strings, don't quote me on this. I think the Matthew strings are probably running, I might go a little higher, like 170 maybe for strings and cables. But depending, if they have to, say they have to lube something, say they have to adjust something, say that, you know, something's not quite right. They can figure that out. Our, our technicians here are amazing. Um, I have a great, great team out here. Um, price wise, I don't honestly, I don't deal with the technical side of that. I don't work on bows and unless it's like a kid's bow. So I don't do the sales. They do the sales up front. So honestly, I, I would call the shop or call a shop in your area to get a, a good, accurate quote. And like you said, I had, um, I just took my PSE in to get looked at for restringing it. And I think these, um, John up there said, 150 to 200 dollars so but okay. i think i suppose it figures between different bow manufacturers and all that stuff too and whatever yeah. so or if you want something funky like some custom strings or something like that or a special kind of string and cable yeah hot yep. pink and purple are famous in my house but <laughs> yeah you do have that don't you <laughs> uh mark was wondering do you have a rule of thumb for following less than ideal hits in warm weather well, like I said, if you hit them back, or if you're not quite sure, let them lay. Let them lay. 
Um, so if you if you know and if you follow through and if you see that that arrow like went a little bit far back, wait at least six hours. Um, I had this actually happen to me a couple years ago in Missouri. I hit a doe. I was really high up and I I tried to miss her backbone because I was really high up and she was right underneath of me. And when I hit her, it kind of came through and then popped out the other side, but she kicked and then she trotted like four steps and then she walked. And I was like, well, I know she's dead. I mean, she's dead. I just have to wait for her to die. And so I just watched her with my binoculars for like an hour. I sat up there. I did not get down. I did not look for my arrow. I did not. I just watched where she went. So when you have that shot, pay attention, listen, you know, where did the deer go? If I can't see it anymore, do I hear it? Did it fall down? Um, and then like make mental markers. So I saw where she laid, she laid there for about 20 minutes, about 60 yards away. Then she got up, she went another 20 yards um, into this CRP, some um, set aside land. And when she went in there, there was like a little tree that I used as a marker. It looked like a truffle a tree out of like Dr. Seuss. And that's how I kept an idea of where she went in. But I snuck down, that hour had been passed. I snuck down, I went way around that food plot, got out to my truck, went back to camp. We let her lay for six hours, six hours. And then we came back and she was still alive. She was like on her last dying breath, but she was still alive. And I did, I, I did the ethical thing. I shot her a second time. And um, the funny thing is, is that the the guy who was there tracking with me, he's like, well, I know she's here. And I'm like, well, yeah, I know she's here somewhere too. And he goes, no, look up. And he looked up and I looked up and there was an eagle there. The <laughs> eagle was waiting. He was waiting for his meal. And so I would have yep. never thought to look up, but I've heard of people looking like for crows. They'll look for crows, they'll look, and I'm, I would have never thought to look up, but you know, you learn really cool things when you're around people that, that do this all the time. So it's true. Yeah. You don't watch old spaghetti Westerns. You always look for the vultures. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so funny. <laughs> uh, Mark was asking about any advice on calls and scents throughout the four month archery season. Oh, you can utilize a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I, I've used deer urine before, um, doe urine, doe and heat. I've loved that. Um, I've actually put that on a wick and then dragged it with a length of string behind me out to my stand and then tied it. Um, some states have rules as far as if you can leave that out there or not. Um, I've done where I've just, you know, put a little squirt of urine around um in the area where i wanted to shoot i've used um rattling horns um the cool thing about rattling horns is if you're in a blind like make that noise with your feet too like because they hear they hear the rattle but they're expecting if you've ever seen two bucks sparring there's a lot of noise there's cracking of tree limbs there's like the the you know it almost sounds like just pounding of them and the leaves and the ground. So you can make a lot of noise too. Um, but I, I love, I love using scents. I love using, um, using those rattling horns every once in a while, like the, the rub, the stick ones, those are fun to work with. Or if you even have the horns, they just get more in my way. If I actually have a set of horns and, you know, older horns smell or smell older horns sound different than what new horns do so if you if you use a lot a couple different kinds of rattling horns you'll notice there's a definite difference in the sound of them so we want to okay. pay attention to that too but grunts too if it's if the bucks are in in rut and they're grunting and you want to use those horns and throw some grunts in there have some urine out mm -hmm. super fun Sometimes I even use little... decoys. Decoys are super fun too. <laughs> I've never tried a decoy. That'd be fun. It's Sometimes so making fun. those little sounds like a little pleat or a, a grunt yeah. will get a buck to stop in your shooting lane too, which is helpful yeah. if they're on a mission for something else. Yeah. Uh, Lucas was asking, do you believe that high pressure days and cold weather makes big mature bucks get on their feet and move early in the season? You know, I have... I have horses, not that the horses are deer, 
but whenever that barometer changes, the horses act differently too. So um, yeah, if, if you are really getting into that and you wanna pay attention to that, by all means do so. I mean, the horses act differently, the animals act differently. Um, even today, my barn cat was kind of crazy because it was a little chilly this morning. <laughs> So, so it, it does, it makes a difference, you know, um, but, I know we were up fishing in Ely and that cold front came through and it shut Saturday down pretty good. Sunday was better. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it makes a difference for sure. Like, and it's really cool when you get that into it, that you're really looking into those parts, you can get super technical. And I just, I love hearing more and more about that stuff just because it's, it's awesome to learn new things. And I think the. One thing I learned through doing some of the learn to hunt stuff that we have online that I think Amber linked to in the chat there in some of those videos, but they kind of have, you know, they go through the rut, but there's kind of a pre-rut time where all the bucks will get together and they kind of figure out who's the dominant buck, right? So there's a lot of uh, pre-rutting that goes on during the archery season too that um, get those bucks out there moving at mm -hmm. kind of weird times of the day too, so. Yeah. It uh, looks like David put one more in the chat. Uh, back to back to the strings and cable changing. Is it too late to do that now if he wants to hunt in mid-October or should he try to get that in and get it done and get some practice real quick? So the funny thing is, is usually um, July is usually the start of our busiest season here at the archery shop. That's usually when things just start revving up. Um, and I think, was it last year? We have a whole area of bows that are being worked on above our technicians in the front. And they turned that over, I don't even know how many times. It, it was six times or something like seven times, they turned that whole thing over um, just with bows. So the, the closer you get to season, the more issues you're gonna have getting that stuff done, um, just because the techs are so busy. Um, we get a lot of bows that yeah i'm going this weekend and it's like <laughs> you're in line yep. you're in line either you got to try and use what you got right now or you can wait it you know leave your bow here and we'll get to it when we can get to it so um if you're if you're thinking you're going to be hunting in the fall june is a great month to get that stuff done not that it's too late right now obviously if it needs to be checked um but you know or even in the winter months when things aren't so busy, but then Christmas comes and things get busy again too, so. Uh, David, get them in there as fast as you can and, and hopefully yeah. they can get it set up and <laughs> get you a little practice before mid-October, so. Yeah. Uh, Douglas asked one more question. He says, thank you, and ask if there's a good rule of thumb for archery hunting as far as how much space you give each other on public land if you're in a bigger piece of property. I'm assuming you don't wanna see each other. I've I know we, we've talked about you hunting more private land. I've hunted some public land around here. And I've had people stumble, you know, real close to my stand before. Yeah. I, I don't know if you have any a good rule of thumb for that or. You know, the hard part is, is sometimes if you get in there, say you pick a really good spot. I've run across this deer hunting, um, not bow hunting, but bow hunting on private land. I've run across this, but um Gun hunting one year, I it was dark when I got in there. And then as it became light, I looked and 50 yards over, there was another gun hunter in a tree where I could see him. <laughs> and really, I mean, it's like, what do you do? But when it's bow season, I mean, people are camouflaged. You can't, if you see someone, yeah, shift away, move away, um, you know, try to give them as much space as possible because they, you know, they don't want their hunt ruined, just like you wouldn't want your hunt ruined. But with camouflage, it's tough sometimes. And we had mm -hmm. we had one archer that came in last year that he was bow hunting and um, a woman came through, a woman came through and she, she was squirrel hunting with a pistol. And wow. she actually was shooting and got pretty close to him. And he was like, wait a second, I'm up here. And she, like was so surprised because she didn't know he was there um, but she was in regular clothes out there just grabbing some squirrels um but you know that can even happen too because if you're bow hunting on private land you know those those small game hunters could be coming through too so just if you see yeah. somebody just try to give them space you know 
I don't know, That's... even public land, you know, if you give people space on, or private land, if you give people space, they're going to be a lot happier with you than if they keep walking past your stand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Give them, give us space as much as you're comfortable giving them. So yeah. sometimes it's, I like to be able to know where they are, give as much yeah. space and still know where you are. So yeah. I think with that, it's just after one o'clock. So great job today. I did want to remind you. everybody, you just mentioned uh, squirrel hunting. It is in Minnesota this coming weekend, learn, uh, take a kid hunting weekend. So if you're an adult and take a youth out there under 16 with their license, you don't need a license to go uh, small game hunting with them. So if you're out there and that's something that interests you, take advantage of that. And there's some other Moss videos on small game hunting and squirrel hunting um, you can look at in our past webinars. So with that, I think we can stop the recording. Thank you everybody for attending. And 